Welcome, everybody, to Guitar Mastery Talk. I'm Tom Hess. I'm so glad that you are here. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about what happened to music over the centuries. And we're streaming live right now on YouTube and on Facebook. And we'll be speaking with a very special guest today. Uh, and this is the leading authority of music theory for guitar, who I know, uh, who just so happens to hold a PhD. Of course, I'm talking about Dr. Tommaso Zilio. Welcome to Tommaso. Hello, internets and Tomas. So nice to see you. <laughs> All right. So Dr. Zilio, as you well know, music changed and evolved over many centuries. Uh, and what we have today is very, very far from how music started, how music and music theory began. Uh, but today I want to talk primarily about how changes of music occurred. So I'll just, I'll let you, I'll let the start open-ended and ask you, so what happened to music? And um, how did music evolve over time from, let's say, single melody only all the way through what became polyphony, multiple melodies at the same time. I'd like to respond on that? That's a pretty big question. But <laughs> uh, if you want a wide spectrum, or at least, of course, everything I say, it's part research and part my opinion. So we can discuss all that. Uh, it goes without saying, of course. But um, the, the way people were hearing music changed. Okay, it's very natural for us humans to hear, for instance, a rhythm or to hear a melody. It's less natural to hear chords or more than one melody at the same time. Uh, and when, when I mean less natural, I just mean, it doesn't mean anything bad. I just mean that it's more complex in a sense for us to understand this kind of thing. So music gradually evolved from a single melody, which is what we can do with our voice essentially, and we literally evolved to understand each other's voice, so that was easy for us to understand and communicate with this kind of music. And then we found that we could make something more beautiful, uh, or at least the people who changed that perceive it as more beautiful, by putting more things on top, like harmony or chords or different voices. And so the history of music, if you want, is kind of the history of the way we discover to make something beautiful. Okay, and uh, when people talk about how the music changes in different cultures, it's it's kind of a, the, the history of technology of music. Like we found a new way to make something beautiful. We found a new way to to um, create feeling in each other, to communicate feelings to each other. And the more we learn, and the more the more we have uh, different tools at our disposal to make music, and. Um, so, and also what they tell you today, we were talking about this just a moment ago before starting all this, that what they tell you today is that music, music history, as they tell you today, it's kind of a fairy tale, okay? It's kind of a sanitized way that explained it to you very fast in college at the university, because if you go uh, and, and actually see what's, what is happening there and um, how those people thought about music, you find uh, different interesting things, different ways of thinking, I mean, radically different ways of thinking and how we think today. I'm going to give you an example right now, but of course, I mean, you know exactly this example is that today we think of everything in terms of chords, okay? To the point that for some people learning music theory is learning chords and uh, for them music theory is like, I have those four notes, uh, how do I call this chord? But for instance, musicians in the Baroque era did not think about chords at all. And there is a good case that some musicians, in, even in the later, in the Romantic era, did not think about chords that much. They were thinking more about counterpoint and voices and other kind of structures rather than just chords. Um, chords were invented slash discovered in the first half of the 18th century. So in, I think um, Jean-Philippe Rameau publishes his uh, treatise on, on chords in uh, 1720 or 2030 something, the first half of the, uh, of the 18th century. And the idea behind that is that before we were not thinking about chords. Okay, before uh, we thought 
on how to superimpose different voices, okay? But we're not thinking about chords, and we we're definitely not thinking about chord inversions. So there was this big debate at the time. If a chord made by the notes C, E, and G, which we call today C major, okay, well, I can play it this way. So with the C at the bass, was if this was the same chord as the chord with E, C, and G, so with the E at the bass, okay? And they all knew, of course, it's evident that the notes were the same, but they were wondering if, is this the same thing or is this a different thing? And there was this big debate. And on one side, we have Jean-Philippe Rameau and some of the French theorists saying, it's the same thing. And the important thing is the root of the chord, which is not really a natural idea. It's something that you need to learn to hear. And on the other side, we had, uh, for instance, Johann Sebastian Bach, and his family saying that, no, those are two different things. And what is important are the voices, the melodies we work on, and not how all those, what is the actual set of notes. And then we have the also different, I mean, this was the, the debate between Germany and France, for instance, but there was also the Italian school at the time, that's a completely different idea. They were like, uh, we don't really care about all these kind of, of chords, etc. We, uh, for the Italian school, everything was practical, meaning, um, who cares if it's the same thing or not? Let's sit down and play this stuff. <laughs> okay, that was literally the way they were training. Okay, and, and they realized that they, they, they were the same notes, but they had a completely different approach to all that. So, some people were thinking about chords. Some other people were not thinking about chords at the time. And now, and then, the idea of chords eventually became the dominant idea. Was it the best, the better idea? Maybe. I mean, you definitely make different music thinking about those things. Um, my opinion is that today we think too much about chords, <laughs> okay? And we get into all these things. I mean, today, for instance, a lot of music is made by loops of four chords. So you take four chords, you loop those four chords endlessly, and you make variations on these, which I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just saying that personally, I've heard too much of that, <laughs> okay? I want to hear something different from modern music. But I mean, you, you turn, today again, you, 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 for instance, you, you watch any movie and it's always those four chords, okay? In crescendo, then in the crescendo, then in crescendo. And it's, it starts to become a bit old as an idea, okay? But I mean, people do whatever they want, okay? And this was not a debate that, that happened only in Baroque music. This happened, this, this kept happening, okay? So a big difference between, uh, uh, for instance, tonal jazz like bebop and modal jazz was exactly seeing things as chords or seeing things as lines, okay? And I'm not gonna go into depth in that right now because that's actually way more technical <laughs> than than what we can do in an hour, okay? That would, that would require a couple of hours only to explain what was before, what was after, and with all the details. But it's a similar kind of debate, essentially. So um, there is not one right way to see music. That's the thing. There are different approaches and tools and different ways of hearing music that we have, and depending on which one you find more natural, you understand some kind of music and understand less some other kind of music. And of course, you can learn to listen to all music. That's, I mean, it's not that you are born with one thing and you're, you're stuck there, but it's mm, there are definitely genuine differences in how we perceive music. It's not something given, and there are definitely genuine differences in how we think about music when we compose. And again, those are genuine. They are, they are not one is right, one is wrong. There are, there's more than one way to understand how to make sounds that evoke emotion in other people and um, how to think about that. And the resulting music is different. And it's fun, honestly, <laughs> I mean, it's, because you, you can always learn another approach and try to take it into, into your own music. Okay. so. That, that's very short, <laughs> what happened to music, okay? But we can go on in details with that, okay? And um, uh, we started all these by just playing melodies, okay? And, and the, 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 the journey from a single melody to what we have today, it's been long and it's been an accumulation of ideas. And um, 
incidentally, right now I'm talking mostly about European music because that's the music that made this specific kind of journey. Other kinds of music, other cultures, other uh, styles of music, uh, I don't know, the gamelan music, the Hindu music, the all the Makra music in the Middle East, um, they made the different kind of journey. They never went to courts, for instance, which again is not to say that they are better or worse. They just took a different road and they explored the melody side much more. So in this kind of um, musical traditions, uh, we have more, uh, more drones, so more uh, low notes or high notes played throughout the song, which can change throughout the song, but not as often as we change chords, for instance. And they explore more intervals in the scale and more kind of um, ideas that it's, are more melodic and less harmonic. Okay, which again, not to say it's better or worse, it's different, a different way of thinking about music, and it's interesting too. Okay, but um, we have to distinguish that because different cultures took different roads. And as far as I know, in, U in Europe, the European music was the only kind of music who took that harmonic road okay and indeed probably it's probably that important because we are european <laughs> or we have this kind of culture and so we uh, give more importance to that okay but as far as i know that's the only time in history when this happened okay which i mean i may be wrong if anybody knows more about that i want to know <laughs> okay uh and the idea that we started from melodies too so we started from um, things like the gregorian chant okay and then I'm, I'm telling all the things you know already, don't mess. <laughs> it's, um, but the Gregorian chant is essentially a melody, okay? And it's fun how there are there were different factions inside the Gregorian chant community too. It's not really different than what it is today. Different people were teaching in a different way. And there was a strong competition on how, what was the right music theory. Um, the whole story of Guido D'Arezzo. Guido, Guido was the guy who gave the name to the notes, you know, the ut, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, that was changing in do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, or re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, depending on who you ask. Um, Guido, was living in the year 1000, like right at the millennium. It was a millennial, but first millennial, not, not a second millennial, like the today's good guys. And uh, he invented this system of um, learning music because at the time, most people were spending most of the time learning those melodies by heart. And they had a lot of melodies to learn. And it took 10 years to train uh, a cantor, a singer, okay? And they found this system, and the system was a mix of uh, music notation, which he did not invented, but he, he made his own music notation, and a system of mnemonic associating every note with every joint or every bone of their hand. So you could think of a melody by walking through your hand, okay, which was very mnemonic and very interesting. Uh, and he, he found a way to train a singer in two years rather than 10, which was a big improvement. But of course, everybody who all his all his competitors uh, were not really happy about that. So he was actually kicked out of a monastery <laughs> because of that. Um, then he went to another monastery, set up his system, trained singers there, then he got an audition with the Pope and, and, then, and then his system went uh, became the dominant one, essentially. But it's interesting how there is all this thing. Uh, and this was just melodies, okay? So, and all those melodies, by the way, um, they tended to stay a lot on a single note sometimes, and then change a lot of notes, and then stay on a single note for a while, depending on what the melody was doing in the religious function, because this is all religious music. What they found at a certain point is that they could sing more than one note at the same time. Because, I mean, the original melodies, again, they're all... They were all, all these kind of things, simple, just a single note. Then they realized that they can play octaves with that. Okay, which for us is pretty obvious, but for them it was not. You could play this, the same note, one octave below. Okay, and then they started experimenting using fourths, fifths, thirds, okay, so, so these kind of things. Okay, or or um, this kind of thing.
Not that that doesn't finish here, so they were not using this to end a song, and all this kind of thing. Until, at a certain point, they stumble on thirds. And when they stumble on thirds, everything changes in a sense, because they start realizing that um, the two voices do not move at the same way. Because when you're playing with fourths and fifth, if, if you play with the C note and you go up, let's say, two frets on your guitar, so two half step, and the note just below does the same, like in the octave or in the fifth, okay? The note moves together. But when you start talking about thirds, one note may move up two frets and the other note may move, may move up one fret. And so what they were doing, it was a bit hard, harder to sing, but it sounded better, so they end up with this idea of starting with an octave, like C and C. Then the first voice was moving up, C to D, and the second voice was moving down, C to B, creating a third, and they were keeping the thirds for most of the piece. creating the first cadence, <laughs> okay? It, the, the final thing, today we call these a 5 to 1, like a G to, to a C, because it contains the notes B and D, which are part of this, what we call the G chord, and these are, it's an octave for C. So that's one thing they were doing, and then they experimented putting fifths and sixths on all these, and, try, and, and they created this, some chords. This whole system of singing melodies in parallel is called Faux Bordon, or Falso Bordon in Italian, or there's another name in German that I cannot remotely pronounce. Okay, and uh, they started singing with this idea, having several melodies in parallel, but the same melody in a sense, only at different intervals. And then, maybe by mistake, maybe by because they tried to, in the centuries, they started shifting those melodies in time, so one was moving before the other, okay? Something like... And sometimes the top voice was moving, moving first, sometimes the second, the, the bottom voice was, was moving first, and so they started shifting those melodies slightly apart. And this created the first kind of polyphony. Okay, it was very simple, but it was very effective too. Okay, and then again, this evolves and evolves, and in the Baroque era, we get at the pre-Baroque and Baroque era, where we start to have a different aesthetic, but the idea was to try to write those melodies, but instead make them as independent as possible, no, not the same melody, but try to make them, every time you can, you have to go the opposite direction, or shift the timing, it, it kind of evolves as a, as a different aesthetic, and so they start, for instance, forbidding the parallel fifths, because the parallel fifth sounds a lot like um, like Gregorian chant. They sound like old music, so they forbid forbid those because they sounded old and they wanted a new sound. Okay, which is interesting because today we're actually getting back to that because the old sound is without the parallel fifth and the new sound is with because we forgot about that. And so, yeah. And they started evolving this kind of idea of as many melodies as we can, <laughs> okay? To the point that we have some pieces by Palestrina that, that they have like 30 independent voices or semi-independent voices, which is crazy. They're they crossing all the time, okay? And then we get to Bach where we, we, are, we stabilize to, uh, to either two, three or four independent voices, but with a lot of elaboration in those voices. And at a certain point, halfway through the 17th century, people go like, okay, that's enough. That's too much. That's too complex. And they go back to a simpler kind of music. They call the, they call the galant music or galant music, depending on how you pronounce the French or the English way. And this is more similar to court. And then again, Rameau comes at, around that period and those ideas comes. And then these gradually evolve into Mozart, which is still more or less a galant composer. And some people are going to slam me for that. <laughs> but it is definitely in that kind of evolution, and then music becomes very conventional at this point, meaning that they have 
specific set patterns. It's kind of formula music, like pop today. <laughs> okay, that's why Mozart was able to compose that much. Okay, he, Mozart has, let's say, around uh, thirty to forty patterns in mind, but a thousand ways of putting those patterns together. And so, when, whenever Mozart composes something, he just starts with a pattern, puts them down, elaborates them. And he's practically thinking about those patterns and, and writing down the music at the same time. And so you can write a lot of music this way. And it's very fast. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a very good system. And you can create a lot of melodies in this way. It's, it's, it's not that it's superficial or anything. It, it depends on the ability of the composer. And then, again, we get to... After Mozart, we get into the Romantic era with Beethoven, and Beethoven refuses all these. I mean, he still uses some of this stuff, but Beethoven has the idea, not like, we have, let's expand music again, let's make music complex again, okay? And there's a completely different idea on how to make music, less patterns, uh, more, 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 it's more taking a theme and reusing the theme different times in different ways throughout the, the song. Indeed, Beethoven rediscovers Bach, okay, you know, this kind of thing. And again, it's, it's, it's always this kind of pendulum between different ideas on how to make music. And every generation is trying to react to the previous generation by doing the different thing. And so discovering new things. Okay, and, and, and it's very interesting to go and see all these, um, all, all, all the little details, etc. And um, um, part of it, it's that the culture is different, that the ideology is different, and the mm, people like different kind of music depending on you know, on the period i mean, I mean the, the romantic movement is not only in music it's also in other kinds of art so all, the whole idea change from the classical which is very um conventionally very orderly and very equilibrated and balanced to the idea of the romantic um not only composers but writers etc of making asymmetric things and making the emotion first and the reason later, which is, of course, a false dichotomy, but that's what they were thinking at the time. Um, <clears throat> and also the interplay that we have with technology at the time, because that's the other thing that they, they don't really teach you that much, and they should, is that the instruments those, those people had change in time. Gregorian chant were using only voices, and so they are limited by what, what a voice can do. Okay, and then later we invent other instruments. We invent keyboard instruments. Then we invent um, different kinds of um, wind instruments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then the more we invent, the more the musician immediately sees the instrument and try to make something new with them. So a lot of what Bach was doing <clears throat> when he arranges things is using this new instrument, which is the oboe. <laughs> okay, and the, the original oboe is completely different than what we have today because it has only three keys. An oboe today has, what, 15 or something keys? I don't know exactly, but it was a very a much simpler instrument with less technical capabilities, okay? And uh, all the string instruments were different at the time. They were using gut strings and not metal strings like today, so that the, their technical abilities are completely different, okay? And their sound is different, okay? So they're really trying to leverage everything they can from the new instruments every single time, okay? Um, the the fifth symphony of beethoven is very famous it's the famous one everybody knows the fifth okay that symphony is so powerful because beethoven is the first one to seize upon on the new instrument that came on the scene which is the trombone there were trombones before but most of the trombonists were amateur players because there was not no way to make a career as a trombonist <laughs> okay there was not enough money around okay there was not enough situation where a trombone could be used. A trombone is super loud, okay? So you need a bigger orchestra to make it work. Beethoven makes a slightly bigger orchestra. And Beethoven is also kind of a businessman. So at this point, he has the money to hire a, tr a trombonist and pay them to practice more. And he writes this symphony with trombones, which makes the whole symphony way more powerful. And by the way, those trombones are kind of primitive respect to the instruments we have today. So they can play only some specific notes. So the genius of Beethoven there is to go around all the limitation of the instrument and writing great melodies using only the few notes that the instrument can hit. And it, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see how those people arrange all that. 
and how music changes from, say, from Beethoven to Wagner, because all the trombones and the trumpets and the horns can now play more notes. So the harmony that Wagner uses is way more complex than the harmony that Beethoven used. Because now Wagner can use all those brass instruments to play those complex kind of chord progressions and ideas that Beethoven could not. Okay. So it's interesting about all that. It's, there are a lot of things going into it and it's not just the way we think. It's also the capabilities we have, the culture of the time, the reaction to the previous uh, generation and the previous music. And so music theory is constantly changing from this point of view. Okay. Very good. So one of the things that I, I want to just add to what uh, you just talked about, Dr. Zidio, is that these changes that started, you know, a couple thousand years ago, and then took these changes, many of them took centuries. So in a sense, there were composers that were born into a particular tradition, let's say monophonic music, where they had just melody only. And they would have spent their entire lives only hearing and creating and writing and playing music like that, one melody at a time, and that was it. And they, they would live their whole life and die, and music had not essentially evolved from that perspective, at least, beyond that point. And that would go on for a long period. And then, as you mentioned, Gregorian chant, and a lot of that is single line, the early Gregorian chant is single line melody over a drone. So you have a low bass note, and you, you referenced this earlier. So composers were, were basically had a bass note drone, which rarely changed. And then they had a melody on top. So that was the first real instance, melody over drone, where people had heard the relationship, the simultaneous relationship between two or more notes, in this case, just two notes, the, the drone note, whatever that was, usually the root or, or what would be today the fifth of a key. And then the melody notes is they're changing, you know, against the drone. And then we start to hear those intervals happening simultaneously. And that went on for a very, 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 very long time. I mean, we're talking about centuries. And then from there, then as, as you had mentioned, uh, there is some, you know, adding the octaves and then fourths and fifths. Um, because it's interesting that um, in centuries ago, the interval of a third was considered a dissonance, and fourths and fifths were considered consonants. Today, it's exactly the opposite. The, well, a fifth is considered, let's say, a diminished fifth, but um, the interval of a fourth is generally perceived as a dissonance, and we would typically resolve fourths two thirds. But back at that time, it was heard in the exact opposite way for quite a long time. And then what had happened, as you had also mentioned, is that we have the start of two melodies happening at the same time with some sort of independence. And you, you had mentioned, you didn't use the term, but you described it perfectly, the oblique motion where one note changes while the other note stays the same, similar to what happened when you had single line melody against a drone, but then here that would reverse roles where the bottom voice may move while the top one sustains. So it was oblique motion. And then later, as you described, uh, came contrary motion uh, where most, you know, voices are moving in opposite directions um, to gain more independence. So, you know, it, it took hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years for all of this to happen to the point where we get polyphony at its extreme. You mentioned Palestrina and well, Monteverdi from the Renaissance. This is the era right before the Baroque era. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm talking to everybody else, not to you, doctor. I know you understand all this. Um, but where there were, you know, a dozen or more separate independent melodies happening, at the same time, very, very, very complex from that perspective. But if you would go back and analyze that from, from our, uh, you know, 21st, 20th, even 19th or 18th century, uh, well, maybe 19th century might be the limit of music theory understanding, we might go and look at that, make a harmonic analysis of all of those vertical lines and put them into fairly common um, harmonic structures, many triads in, in, in particular. 
Uh, but all of the music changed so slowly. Uh, part of it was for the reason you mentioned of, you know, the slow evolution of instruments. But there were many other factors, of course, uh, that went into that. And one being just tradition. Um, lack of information and a, a variety, of, and, and the fact that people just liked the sound, they were they were happy with uh, those sounds, and you know today music changes in in some sense more rapidly. We have emergences of of new styles, particularly in the in the twentieth century, um, et cetera. But it, it the point is, it took us a long, long, really long time to get here and even make simple changes um, in how melodies were created and, you know, getting from single melody to multiple melodies and then getting those melodies to line up where they sounded pleasing together. And um, you also referenced this uh, about after the Baroque era, after the time of Bach, essentially, we get into the classical era, which is Haydn, Mozart are the two main composers, two biggest composers of that era, where it, it kind of went, uh, you know, chord and then single melody on top. That was it's called um, uh, homophonic music, chord melody, which is common to what we have today in popular music, chord melody. Um, and then later, as you also reference in the in the uh, Romantic era, it was starting Schubert and um, Beethoven, uh, this counterpoint from the Baroque era and earlier started to come back, where line the way that lines within the chords moved became important again. And I think that was really important that this did not get lost. And that helped carry voice leading forward into, you know, more modern times, although you don't see it much in popular music, but it certainly exists in, in some music. And it's a it's, it's a beautiful thing to sort of conceive those two things at the same time. And when I was a student in university, I was a composition major. I didn't go to school for guitar. I went to compose music. And one of the challenges uh, that one of my professors, my composition professors kept uh, drilling me into, they're trying to drill into my head was to conceive of writing music, both horizontally and linearly, because as a guitar player, who grew up listening to you know rock and heavy metal and stuff? It's basically homophonic music, right? It's chords and then melody on top. So I was very much thinking in chords all the time, and not oh, the only time I thought you know horizontally was with whatever solo or melody I was playing on top. But the chord construction itself was just block chord to block chord to block chord. You know, very typical, very boring. And um, so that's something that helped me uh, for songwriting was to be able to be thinking this way and this way with all of the individual voices or all the individual notes of each chord. So if you have a C chord moving to a G chord, how, do the, how does each individual note of each chord move? How do we get from the fifth of this chord to whatever it's going to become in the next chord? created many videos uh, on YouTube in particular uh, outlining how this works in various situations. You're Augmented six chord uh, videos are, are, are a great example um, of this. So we talked basically in a nutshell a couple thousand years of how we went from single melody only up to polyphony. And of course, we've had to skip a bunch of things in between for time. Um, but now I wanted to talk about or ask you to talk about how music evolved from the church modes. The church modes, for those who don't know, are... Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, and Locrian, the, the, what we typically call the modes, used to be called the church modes. So from, let's say, pre-1600 to tonality the, in the common practice period from 1600 to 1900, that period there. So now we hear music primarily in, in, in a tonal sense. But how did music evolve from the church modes to tonal music, music that are in major or minor keys. You want to elaborate a little bit on that? Well, first we have to understand that the modes, the way the Gregorian chant or the previous tradition, the Renaissance tradition used them, are not exactly how we think about the modes today. 
And indeed, the idea of the um, Renaissance music or the Gregorian chant of Mozart is very sim much, is much more similar to the idea of the Indian raga, meaning that you have a scale, but you don't have only a scale because you have a set note, which is what we call the root right now, the tonic, which is your main note. But then you have also a designation of a secondary note in the mode. Okay, which is not always the same. That's why when you go and study Gregorian chant, you have modes like the Lydian and the Hypolydian, depending on which one is the secondary note, or the Mixolydian and Hypomixolydian, all this kind of they have this kind of strange names, which refer to which one is the secondary note. Because the idea is pretty much this. Uh, let's say you are in C, okay, and let's get let's do the the Ionian thing, okay. So it's it's a major scale. You make a little melody around your tonic note. And then in the second part or in the second phrase goes around your secondary note. Okay, and then they tend to gravitate between again the main note and the secondary note. And the main note is always what we call the tonic. The secondary note can be the fifth or the fourth of the key. So you have what they call, what today we will call the authentic mode, with the one with the fifth as the secondary note, and the, what today we will call the plagal mode with the fourth as the secondary note, because today we will tend to hear that fourth as the root, because we prefer to hear a 5-1, not, not a 4-1. But anyway, um, so there were, there were two more important notes in the mod, and the other notes of the mod were just embellishing notes to sing around those notes. This structure may be kept throughout the whole piece of music or may change, so you can have a section in, mix in Mixolydian and the second section in Hypomixolydian or change to Ionian and all this kind of thing. But it wasn't the most as we think today. It wasn't just seven notes and use them however you want. There were specific prescriptions on how to use those notes. And again, those prescriptions are not somebody has sat down and said, that's how you make music, live with it. That's how they were naturally making music, that's how they were naturally hearing that, and then they formalized it and used this to create more music and understand the music they were doing and to write down this music and all this kind of thing. What happens later is that, again, we start adding more harmony to those, um, to, those, to, those, to those lines. And the harmony you can add to a generic scale like a mod is limited, okay? For various reasons. I don't really want to go into the mathematical side of things, okay? <laughs> it's going to be complex. But for various reasons, uh, when you go beyond a certain threshold of harmony. So when you start adding more voices and making those voices more independent, it's really hard to do it in Dorian, for instance, because in Dorian is, the, is like minor, but as the sixth note is major, it's, it's raised respect to minor. And that sixth note will disturb your chords and make you move to a different tonic when you play the chords. It gives you the feeling of going to a different tonic. So turns out that the major scale and the minor scale are the ones that can support more harmony. And so gradually, when, when we were exploring more and more harmony, we forgot the other modes because they could not support that much harmony. Until between the 1600 and the 1700, we completely abandon all the modes and we, get, and we do only things in major and minor. Because at this point, the style is to put as much harmony whether you think about these as chords or independent voices, but put as much harmony as we can on those scales. Okay. And this has to do with the idea that once you hear a triton, you want to resolve it in a specific way. And that this seems to be something that is hardwired into our brain. So it's kind of unavoidable. If you want to have enough harmony, you have to play in working major and minor. And, and then we stay there for a while. And there is this, um, hilarious um, correspondence between different music theorists at the court of France. And we are talking now um, just before the French Revolution. So in the 1770s, give or take, or 60s, we already forgot all about the modes. And um, apparently the king of France was 
taking a, a, a stroll somewhere and he heard somebody singing and they were singing with the wrong scale, but it worked. Okay, so all the music, he goes back to, the, to this court and asks his music theorist, what the heck is happening here? I mean, I know about music, I'm playing this, and uh, because all those nobles were educated in music, and but there is a wrong note here and the music theorists could not explain why the whole thing worked and what those people were playing at the end we can reconstruct the whole thing because we can read all those letters they were singing a popular song in mixolydian and the mixolydian is different than major because major is a major seventh and mixolydian is a flat seventh and those music theorists cannot figure out how this flat seventh was working in the context of this music so we kept all this kind of modal knowledge in popular music at the time, in folk music, but all the court music and um, art music completely forgot about all that, essentially. And then later we get, let's say, around uh, post-Wagner, let's say, so the, let's say in a, a couple <laughs> in the 1850s, 1860, so more than a hundred years later, essentially. And then we start exploring th this harmony in an extreme way. And then we start breaking this kind of harmony because now we put too much harmony in a sense. And it's hard to do more uh, just by changing keys and using different tonal centers. And so people go and re-listen re to all the popular music and like, oh, there are different scales there. Maybe I can do something with that. <laughs> then they start rediscovering all these uh, tradition. So we have, for instance, some of the Russian composers who discovered this tradition, and that's why the Russian schools sound different, for instance, than the German school, because they take a lot from the Russian popular music and they put it in, in a different form. And they are still using a lot of harmony, but they found different ways to use this harmony, okay? So that's that's how the whole thing worked. Again, it's, it's and again, it's always a reaction with the previous generation. Um, there was something I wanted to comment about something you said before, because you said that it takes hundreds of years for these things to evolve, and it's very true, especially in the Middle Ages, it took forever. Th that's because, first of all, they had no internet, <laughs> okay? So you can't really, if somebody finds something new, uh, how do you communicate that, okay? And, and the people were traveling very little, I mean, they were traveling in the Middle Age, but uh, it's, they were not doing tours for sure, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's later in the, in the in the Baroque era that people do do again start again doing tours, okay? And we know that Bach went worked walked three days to get to a concert, okay? You know this kind of legends essentially. Um, but they were very, it was very hard to um, disseminate information. So even if somebody had the genius idea, it tended to stay local and then be forgotten eventually because it was hard to communicate those ideas and distribute those ideas around. And, and even later, even in the Baroque and Classical and Romantic era, there are some, some information that stays local. So the, the, the theory of the French theorist is different than the theory of the German theorist and all this kind of thing. Partly because they don't communicate much, partly because they have a lot of national pride, so they don't want to use the theory of the other guy, <laughs> okay? Uh, today we have the internet, it, everything goes way faster and we, even before the internet we had a m much more um, printed book so you could get a Russian book and read it in translation and all this kind of thing. But here's the interesting thing, there is a hilarious comment in uh, one of the books, um, I think it's by Ripper. Ripper was this music theorist, let's say the generation just before Mozart. And I, we know that Leopold Mozart, the father of Mozart, knew about this book because he mentions it, but he was using this to teach the little Wolfgang Amadeus, okay? And I think anything, I think it's Ripple, if not, it's some another music theorist of that age. And there is this comment saying that music changes completely every 10 years. And I'm thinking, to us, all that period of music sounds exactly the same. I'm talking now from 1720 to 1780, give or take, okay? For us, it sounds exactly the same. For them, it sounded completely different. Why? Because we are hearing all that, thinking about uh, chords and chord progressions and melodies, but they were thinking about that as how they could elaborate those patterns. So the elaboration of the pattern is different. Mozart writes this piece called Alla Turca, okay, which is in the style of, of, of Turkish music, everybody knows. Go, go ahead and search Mozart Alla Turca, A-L-L-A -L -L space T-U-R-C-A, which again means in the style of Turkish music. Everybody knows this piece. But it doesn't sound Turkish for us, <laughs> okay? So, 
um, he was trying to imitate some of the Turkish military music, and so there are some percussive elements in, the, in, in how he plays the piano or whatever they were, the kind of piano they had at the time, at least. Um, but for us, it just sounds like plain classical music because we forgot about all those kind of different influences. Um, we are seeing all those things from a distance. So for us, it's all the same kind of music. But when Mozart composed some of this stuff, some of his music, people were thinking that he was using crazy dissonant notes that nobody used before. Okay. So, um, I mean, it's interesting. What, what, for instance, there was this pattern at the time, and this pattern was established in, in the early uh, 17th um, century. Uh, sorry, in the, in the early 16th century. So, so no, wait, in the early 1700s. Okay, <laughs> there. And this pattern is super simple for us. Okay, it's something like. Um, okay, so it's. Four chord. It is two chords for us. It's essentially C to G, G to C. But they were thinking about this in terms of lines. So you start your melody from the root chord, root note, and the accompaniment has the same root. And the second, you have the, you have the second note accompanied by the seventh, and the second note again, but accompanied by the fifth, and the third note of the scale accompanied by the first. And what they were doing with that, they were elaborating this kind of pattern. So. doing all this kind of thing. One innovation that is either by Mozart or the people just before Mozart is to put chromatic notes in that. And we've heard this kind of stuff. It's Mozart. It's, it's how Mozart composes. So part of the original style by Mozart was to use notes out of the scale but use them in the old patterns. So this music sounds old to us because we are hearing the pattern, but this music sounded new to them because there were new notes used into that. So it's interesting because for them, music was evolving at a breaknecking speed and they needed to uh, reinvent themselves as musicians constantly to be able to create music that was um, current for them. It was contemporary for them. But for us, it's not this way. My suspicion, that's my opinion. It could be completely wrong, but I think that probably in 200 years, they're going to listen to our popular music, uh, like rock, country, metal, and put everything together and, th and thinking, this music sounds all the same, <laughs> okay? We are hearing all these kind of differences right now, but maybe in two or 300 years, they will not hear that much difference between a pop country song and a pop metal song, say, okay? It's, I mean, just imagine in 300 years from now, they may confuse, I don't know, Brad Paisley and, and Bon Jovi, and there not, may not be much the difference between those, those people. Like today, a few people can hear a difference between, I don't know, Bach and um, Telemann, for instance, okay? Which, I mean, there's a clear difference once you know what to listen for, but most people, when you li they listen to one, think it's the other. If they had not been listening to this kind of music for a while and understand the difference, essentially. So, at least in that era, they were moving fast. But like you were saying, in the, in the Gregorian chant period, that was really slow because their conception of music was different. Their idea of music was to create something eternal because they were using this to praise God. So they were trying simply to make the best they can and never changing it, like the scripture never changes. So they were not driven by innovation at all. That's why the music clearly. stays the same forever. Like clearly not driven by innovation. Yeah, that, that that's right. And and that leads me to the point I was I was uh, waiting to jump in to, to mention. Uh, one other reason why, uh, well, two other reasons really why um, music had evolved so extremely slow in that period was literacy being being one. So people, particularly in Europe, were completely illiterate, could not read, could not write. I mean, couldn't write their name. I mean, couldn't, period, could not read or write anything, any words. So they certainly couldn't read or write anything musical down. If they sang something, there was no way to write it down. 
if they had a little wooden flute, there was no way to write. They had no way to write it down. Um, and those who did write it down, those who were literate primarily was the church, the Catholics in particular. So they wrote everything down. Um, that, that was a big part of like the monk's jobs was to, you know, write things down and recopy by hand, things like this. So there, there very likely was innovation in the secular non-church music world it's just all lost there was no way for it to really propagate because no one was educated enough in terms of literacy to write it down so there like i said there were very likely different paths different musical styles that went in all sorts of different directions not to the point of heavy polyphony or you know uh stretching tonality to this to the extent of wagner i mean nothing like this or even to bach level but you know, for the time there were things happening, but they're just, it's just all lost. Uh, oral traditions tend to uh, not carry forward complex ideas very well into the future. So that's, that's a big reason. And the second one is that, and you actually did hit on it, is that the church didn't want it to change. They, because of the purpose of the music was this is supposed to be everlasting and this, you know, you know et cetera. So, yeah, those two reasons um, are primarily the reason. But you can you can look at this as well. That seems pretty, unfortunately, almost in, in a sense, it wasn't intended this way. But one could perhaps make an error in judgment and say, well, this was uh, pretty oppressive by the church. Well, the church wasn't oppressing anything, at least in terms of uh, the music there, um, perhaps in other ways uh, at the time, but I won't get into that. But the, but the, but the, certainly not into music. But imagine if uh, the church had not done this, had they, had they not been literate, had they not written anything down, had there not been uh, any of this stuff survived in written format, it would have been like, well, there was no music, like we were all cavemen, you know, until the 14th century. And then all of a sudden there's all this music, you know, once people learn how to, you know, read and write and and uh, copy things and notation. So it's it, it's very good for us uh, today. And uh, we are the beneficiaries of, the, of what the church did do in terms of writing uh, those things down. So one of the things, and we're running a little bit out of time here, but one of the things I was hoping we could touch on today, and if you want to maybe blast through about 300 years, quickly, is um, the stretching of tonality. And I'll repeat uh, for, for those watching, tonality simply means music that is in a key, a major or a minor key, where there is a clear root note, okay, where the, the it, it's there's a strong pull to the root, okay? So when we say tonality, we're primarily talking about major and minor keys, which in the case of minor would also include all three versions of the minor scale, Halian or natural minor, actually, harmonic minor, and melodic minor, it all is just minor. Okay. So in the, um, um, let's, we'll, we'll skip the um, um, Renaissance and just begin at, let's say, 1600, start of the Baroque era. And let's take it up, up to 1900, which is, as you know, is called the period. That's when tonal music really developed and took major form and it, it essentially dies in 1900 although we have tonal music today but in art music and classical music it, it essentially was for the most part dead then so we can start at early bro composers and go all the way through let's say wagner and if you would like to just maybe touch on how music how tonality evolved and why it ceased to advance beyond Wagner. Why does tonality end at Wagner? And it is one, we could even pinpoint it to a specific piece of Wagner. And I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about and bring that up. So I'll, I'll leave it to you to uh, discuss that. Well, the thing is, uh, 
in the whole history of music, it's very hard to get a musician to stick to a specific scale. <laughs> okay, <laughs> musicians don't like to have any kind of limitation. Okay, even today, I you know, teach them that's the major scale. The first thing they say is, "I don't want to use it. I want to get out of the." <laughs> okay? That's the first reaction of any musician, and this was true at the time too. Uh, when they were talking about tonality, they were typically talking about uh, a, a, a temporary thing that may change during the piece. So, in a baroque piece, it typically changes key several times. That's tonality. It's still tonality because in any single moment you are in a specific key, but it changes, it doesn't stay. And I mean, literally from the beginning, we wanted to get out of that set of notes, okay? To the point that if you, for instance, if you check in the Neapolitan school, which is again, uh, first half of the 1700s, they teach you as consonances, courses that are out of key, which is which is great. I mean, they have these this typical descending pattern. They, they have those kind of set pattern that the, the students have to play. And the typical pattern is this, for instance, you know, on a descending scale on the bass. So they have the C, B, A, G. You have the C major chord, the B major, the, the G major chord, the, um, the G major chord in first inversion. Or, uh, we call this today. Then you have a D seventh chord on the A and then the G chord. So this D7 chord is not in the key of C. The whole pattern is in the key of C. And the pattern is supposed to continue. Okay, and then eventually end on C. But they were teaching these D7 chord, which is what today we call a secondary dominant or a fifth of the fifth chord, as a consonance, as part of the key, even if the notes are not in the scale. They were even teaching you stuff like the, the augmented sixth as consonances. It's, it's, it's crazy, I mean. It's... So you will have the same thing in minor. And that's an augmented sixth. Okay, and again, this, this was taught as the basic part of tonality. So when today we teach about uh, tonality and we start from the major scale and we stay in the major scale forever, we are doing a disservice to all this kind of thing because they were teaching those kind of spicy chords already baked in the tonality because it helps strengthen, strengthen the tonality going out of key and coming back in a specific way. So, but they were seeing these as, as a whole system of uh, of, 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 uh, of going back and forth between different centers and starting from a center, going to a different center and coming back to the original center. That was the idea. Um, what changes in the Romantic era is simply that they find different ways of doing all these. While in the, ba in the Baroque and Galant and, and Classical era, they typically move uh, following the circle of fifths, so from the key of C to the key of G, then back to the, C of, the key of C, to the key of F, or doing, using the relative, so C, A minor, G, E minor, F, D minor. So all the keys around there that have only one note of difference from the original. What starts to happen at the time of Beethoven, for instance, that people we want to move further away. And again, this is also a technological thing. We tune the instruments in a different way. Before we were tuning so that one key was perfect and the other was were okay. And so you can stay only close to a specific key before you were going out of tune. By time of Beethoven, we tune in a different way, so we have more possibility of moving further away without having dissonant keys or keys tuned the wrong way. And so Beethoven starts to move in um, in changing key in thirds. So he starts, uh, uh, for instance, in the Waldstein sonata, he starts in C, and then he modulates to E. It's a pretty far modulation, okay? But he makes it super smooth, and and, and then in, in the hammer clavier he does C to a flat, for instance. So it's the other direction. Um, so he moves to very far keys, and he is able to manage all this kind of thing. But his music still sounds in a specific way because the whole music, all the music of Beethoven, is based on the pattern one to five, one to five, or five to one. Okay, so playing the C G C, for instance. Okay. And, but it changes more key and, 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 and further away. So that's what technically distinguished the harmony of classical, the classical period, to the harmony of the romantic period. I mean, or it's one of the elements. Arriving to Wagner, Wagner starts thinking about tonality in a completely different way. He doesn't think in terms of five to one anymore. 
Because one of the points of Wagner music was to try to recover some of the German folk music. And German folk music does not work in terms of five to one. It works in terms of moving the chords by third. So you could hear stuff like... So more modern if you want, or in minor it will do... So moving the chords in third, A minor, down a third to F, down a third to D minor, down a third to B diminished. So there's a, there's a different kind of harmony moving by thirds that were, was not used before, and Wagner just takes from folk music. And why this is important? Because then Wagner starts to do this kind of thing. Again, he moves, was moving from A minor to F. And we, we hear this all the time in pop music today. We actually took a lot from Wagner. But then Wagner starts thinking, can I use some other extra notes that are not in the scale here? And rather than playing A minor, F major, I'm playing A minor, F minor. So he, 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 find, he essentially takes the structure of German folk music, but uses all the ideas of chromaticism and the harmony from um, the classical and romantic music and all the kind of art music at the time and tries to put them together and creates this kind of new sound, which is a sound we know really well. Because it's been used in all kinds of movies <laughs> from, um, from the 70s and later. And everybody has heard Wagner because you guys have seen Star Wars, you guys have seen Indiana Jones, you guys have, 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 have seen all those kind of mu movies, and that's essentially Wagner, okay? One way or another, okay? So, and he starts with this kind of idea and then tries to put together the, 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 those ideas and gradually he breaks away from the idea of being in a specific tonal center, okay? Uh, and it becomes more like a succession of chords, each one with its own center, but it's not anymore established. Okay, it's more floating in a sense. And I know that the piece you were talking about, which is the Tristano on this old, okay, and the, which which is a, an, an incredibly interesting sleigh of hands, harmonically speaking, because it works this way. The Tristano on this old is an opera. It's four hours long okay and what Wagner does in the first two bars he establishes a specific dissonance and he does not resolve it for four hours <laughs> okay so at the end when he resolves it you start crying because it's so <laughs> it's so powerful it's actually even worse than that because at the, at the end of the second act he's about to resolve it and then he changes key at the last possible second <laughs> so it's like taking the resolution away from you but it sounds this way uh, it's very simple. The, 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 the very beginning of the opera starts this way. Oops. Oops. Okay, so it feels like there is this dissonance. That's the dissonance. That's a Tristan chord. And then it feels like it kind of resolved it. The result is the D chord. Okay, so the first chord is an A minor, essentially. The whole piece starts in A minor. The first chord of the key. And he puts this kind of dissonance here, and he resolves it but to an E7, which is the fifth chord of the key. So it's not really resolved, because after that, you want to go here. You want to end this tension going on this A minor again. But it doesn't go there for four hours. <laughs> and he keeps reproposing this kind of sound all throughout the four hours, teasing you all the time. And he does it in different keys, and it breaks out of the key and then back in again. And if you look at the chord progression, it's, it's very obscure because it's just moving in strange ways through those keys, uh, to the point that, again, it's very hard if you look at the score to tell you, to tell in what key he is right, he is right now, <laughs> and then he changes, just for a chord, it's a different key, and then he changes chords in another key, and, and so on and so forth, and only at the end he gives you this kind of resolution, but 
it's like he explored everything you could explore while still using those chords. And after Wagner, people are, to get something new, they have to use something that is much more dissonant or much stranger. They start, after that, they start using stuff like the diminished scale, the augmented scales, and different kind of uh, strange, crazy dissonant stuff to get something new. Okay, kind of, Wagner kind of consumed all this kind of harmony, all this kind of thread of harmony by trying to write everything he can, expanding it to the very maximum extent, essentially. So if you guys want to hear the end of tonality, you listen to Tristan und Isolde. If you guys are not in for four hours of German opera, which I can understand, <laughs> okay, you guys can listen only to the beginning and the end. The beginning is the prelude, of course. The end is called the Liebestod. The, um, the Liebestod translates something like love of death, because of course it's a German opera. At the end, everybody dies. <laughs> okay, it's a, it's a given, it's an opera, okay? Um, which I'm going to make a uh, talk about later. But um, and in the prelude, he established all this dissonance and in the Liebestod, he establishes it again and resolve it. And it, the whole thing takes less than 20 minutes. Okay, it's still a pretty long piece of music for the standard, but it, it just gives idea of the whole arc of the music. And you see, again, I also like to talk about Wagner and, the, and, and operas in a sense, because Today, for instance, when you talk about country music, one of the points <laughs> against country music is that it's overly dramatic. You no, know? I mean, like my girlfriend killed my dog and stole my truck and all this kind of stuff, etc. But uh, have you guys ever ever read? Uh, I mean, one of the the plots of any opera. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean it, it's even more ridiculous and even more dramatic and over the top. Okay, so and practically any any op grab any opera. Grab any opera and read the story behind that opera. They are even more, more, more unbelievable than, than country songs. Okay, which I mean, and that's part of the fun of it. It's everything is so over the top. Okay, it's it's part of the fun of the opera in a sense. Okay, but yeah. yeah and if you don't want to do the four for the, the full four hours, which I understand. <laughs> okay, the beginning and the end. That would be enough to understand at least the idea. And again, after that, people have different ideas. We had different schools of, uh, of what today we call, we call modernist on how to compose music without the tonal structure. And let's say with varying success, <laughs> okay? Some of this music is okay. Some of this music is completely unlistenable to most of us, let's say. <laughs> um, what, what are you trying to say? You don't like serialism? Hey, <laughs> but on it to be Anton fair, Baber, it's not your favorite. To be fair, some of it is actually pretty interesting in short amounts, <laughs> small amounts. Very short. Okay, but there is a structure behind at least. You see, and you, you, if 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 you listen to enough of it, you can latch to that structure and still get a sense of a dramatic change. But other kinds of not all serialism, but uh, some serialist are literally cats on pianos, okay? <laughs> like, that it's un completely indistinguishable from cats on pianos. So, and like, I mean, I'm not saying that it did not have any meaning. I'm not saying it wasn't necess necessary. I'm not saying there is no value in that. I'm just saying that it's not the most popular kind of music to play. And by and large, that's the public completely ignored that. And that's why today we are, we are, we are still stuck with five composers i mean it's 90 percent of music we listen to classical music we listen to it's five composers okay it's uh, bach beethoven brahms mozart and tchaikovsky so the three the, the big b's bach beethoven and brahms mozart because it's mozart and tchaikovsky essentially because of the nutcracker because very few people have heard anything else by tchaikovsky but the nutcracker okay and and of those five composers, we are listening to around 5% of their output. Everybody knows the fifth of Beethoven, but how many, how many people can, can sing anything from the second? <laughs> okay. I mean, or, or something. We, we, we know a few Mozart concertos. We know uh, uh, Brahms, we have specific songs that we like. Okay. It, it, it's very selective and we keep proposing the same few pieces from all those people and occasionally something famous from other composers, but very occasionally and very 
um, and always the same pieces of those, those composers. It's, it's, it's like kind of a stack in there. There's a lot more nice music from those composers and other composers to listen to, and not only these. All right. All right. Very good. So I think we've got a few questions here. I wanted to uh, run by you here. Are there any scales, are there any other scales than major or minor that work well with lots of harmony? You want to tackle that one? Well, and the idea is no. <laughs> no, because all the other scales will have the tritons in the wrong position. And so when you play the triton and you resolve it, and you hear this strong tension resolution, your mind will move to a different route. So if you start something in A Dorian and eventually you play the Triton, you can resolve it to an E minor or a G major, essentially, but it's hard to resolve it back to the A minor chord, which is the root chord in Dorian. So that's the point. It, 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 Kind of an unfortunate thing. <laughs> and the first time you hear about this is very unsettling. Like there are only those two scales that can support that much harmony and the other not, not really. And yeah, that's the problem. Or at least that's the way we hear so far. Maybe, that one of my hope is that maybe we start hearing things in a different way. And maybe in a hundred years or 200 years, we start making harmonic music over modes. And we don't care too much about that writer anymore because we found a different way to establish the root. Who knows? Open research here. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, your assessment there. Generally, I think that perhaps the question could be slightly flawed. It's a legitimate question, but flawed if one is asking, the, and I don't know if Jerry was asking for the reason I'm going to state now, so I could be wrong. But if one was asking the question thinking, um, how much music can I create? What, what scale would allow me to create them harmonically? If that was the, the intent of the question, uh, and I don't know that it was, I would, I probably wouldn't ask such a question. Instead, I would ask, how much music can I create, period, using as much harmony as I want to use? And then how many times might I have to modulate or change scales, use different scales, different keys or whatever, within the same chord progression, let's say, your same piece of music? And now I know Jerry personally, so I know that he is smart enough. Jerry's a very good musician. I know he's smart enough that he knows this. Um, so I'm not sure of the intent of the question because I know that he knows everything I just said. Um, but for So I'm not saying this for Jerry's benefit. I'm saying it for everyone else's benefit uh, who saw the question and, and, and may perceive the question in that way. All right, so there's another question here. Um, Slightly off topic, but music theory related. <laughs> the question, <laughs> what do I say to people to believe that music theory will hinder their creativity? Well, lately I'm not, uh, not saying that much <laughs> because it's hard to change their mind. <laughs> okay. Um, my, my question would be, why would you blind yourself to the collective experience of thousand years of music? <laughs> Okay, we, we, there are so many, dif we found so many different ways of making music, genuinely different ways. So many ideas that, that are still, that, that, that can still be mined, are still ripe to be, to be plucked by us and, and make music with that. Um, so many tools that, that, that we invented to make better music. Why would you avoid Learning about that and music theory. Learning about music theory is learning about music. I mean, it's not. I mean, as long as you don't go into stuff like set theory or other stuff like that, which is less connection with music, and it's, in my opinion, a bit less interesting. Um, but again, whatever you rocks your boat. But um, why would you not learn about music if you want to make music? I mean, it's, and uh, the, the the thing is. All those people who are like, man, music theory hinder creativity. And then you ask them to, 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 to play some music or to write some music, and they all write the same kind of music, <laughs> okay? Because they, they write what kind of music they can imagine based on what they listen 
so far in their life and based on the patterns that they can um, take from the music they've listened so far. So they, they're, first of all, they're prisoner of the moment in time they have been born because that's the music they listen to and that's the pattern they listen to. And so they try to replicate those patterns, whether they are conscious of it or not. And they're completely blind to that. So they, and, and sometimes you ask them, like, uh, how's going with the composing? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm composing always the same thing or the music is biting his tail. I need, I need some new inspiration. That's what music theory is for, okay? That's exactly what it is for. You learn different perspective on the same sounds. If you learn how people were thinking about music 200 years ago, 300 years ago, and it doesn't really take that long, um, you have a completely different perspective on it. And you can take some of this perspective today and mix it with what you have and, and maybe find something new combining those things, okay? That would be one thing. And the other thing is all those people that are saying uh, music theory hinders creativity, blocks creativity, and you ask them to compose some music, the first thing they do is that they take a few chords and they put it together. Guys, what do you think chords are? Chords are music theory. I mean, <laughs> they, 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 but, they were not, but not there naturally. We invented them or discovered whatever, but we found yeah, that- they, Yeah, they, sorry, they are literally music theory inventions. Exactly. The music exactly. theorists we... created chords, not the, not the composers. Exactly, exactly, exa exactly that. And then composers got the idea and ran with that. And, and that's great because you see, people think that music theory comes just after the fact, meaning musicians create music, music theorists go and just describe what happened. That's part of it. But musicians are not stupid. And then they read about music theory because they want new inspiration. And like, I want to see how, how this person was thinking about the music. So musicians take idea from music theory and with those new idea, they create new music. Okay. And so it's kind of an interplay between musicians and music theorists. And sometimes it's the same person, by the way, sometimes it's not, but it's kind of an interplay. Okay. That musician create music, music theorists get, try to understand how it works. Musician read the music theorists and say, oh, this idea is good. Why don't we also do that? And then it, they, they keep feeding each other and, and music improves from that. And the moment musicians start not listening to music theorists anymore or not reading or not being interested, you can feel, you can, you can not totally tell that the music starts to bite its tail and then music starts to be always the same. Again, like those four chord loops that we are hearing right now. And we've been hearing them for what, 40 years? And it's always four chords on and on and on and on. And I mean, sure, I mean, it's, 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 it's it was a new thing 40 years ago. Now it's not anymore. <laughs> okay. So, um, can we do something better than that? Probably we can, but not while we are here thinking, I'm going to ignore everything in the past. Okay. It's, a, it's, it's the usual thing that the people who do not know history are condemned to repeat it and typically repeat it in the worst possible way. And music theory is the same. People who don't know music theory are condemned to repeat the same things done well before them, not knowing it. A lot of people are composing music that follows the exact same patterns as the classical music and they don't realize it. And they could make it way better if they knew those patterns, whether because they would implement the pattern better or whether because they would simply avoid that pattern and do something original. And there was another point, which is randomness is not creativity. Okay. You cannot just say, I'm going to put three random chords together and see how they sound and I'm going to be creative because I'm doing that. No, randomness is not creativity. Okay. Creativity is knowing what you're doing and going beyond that. Or at least that's the way I think. <laughs> okay. Agreed. Agreed. So I want a, a very closely related question, uh, but maybe it's worth uh, including here because it is slightly different. Does knowing so much theory prevent you from being surprised by music i think what is meant there is when you know a lot of music theory are you then never positively surprised when you hear something new because it would then theoretically always be formulaic in some way or you could you could justify what's happening or describe what's happening somehow through music theory that's how i interpret the question 
your thoughts on that, doctor? This is a, this is a great question. It's an amazing question. Thank you, Jason, whoever you are. Thank you, Jason. It's a fantastic question because it's actually completely the opposite. <laughs> That's the point. Music theory shows you, among other things, a number of patterns, okay, a number of structures, a number of ideas. If you know those patterns and those ideas, of course, you are not being surprised when the composer are exactly following them. But that's, that's when, when the game starts and the composer can do something different. And so you're going to be surprised because you were expecting the song or the piece of music to go in a specific direction and it's going in a different direction. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, there is, Beethoven, for instance, is famous for his piano sonatas, and his piano sonatas are great because they take the idea of the original Haydn sonata, which was very regimented, like dot bar of this theme, that number of bars of the other theme, elaborate for this number, other number of bars. And what Beethoven does is start, stretch, start stretching some part and shortening some other part, and then playing with the expectation of the public, which was very clear at the time. It's not as clear in your ear today, but at the time it was very much in the ear that people would listen to this kind of music. And so not giving them the final resolution where they were expecting it, or giving the final resolution too soon, but then doing something just after to relaunch the whole thing. And so all these kind of sonatas are distorted with respect to the original sonata scheme, precisely because Beethoven was kind of playing with the structure and making it more interesting. Now, this example may be a little bit obscure to some people here. So let's give a more modern example. Many of you are familiar with the band Metallica. Okay, and um, Metallica has this song, mm, Master of Puppets. Master of Puppets is in structure, it's a pop song. Verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, verse, chorus, chorus. Okay, it's, it's a very basic pop structure. But what Metallica does in that song, they take the bridge and they expand it a lot. It's the slow part in Master of Puppets, okay? They expand the bridge a lot. They make it way longer than it will be in a pop song. And that's the surprising thing, that this song sounds different than the original because they took a basic pop structure and they did something surprising with that. Okay? The, if you know the structure... No, I don't know if Metallica knew the structure. I, actually, I'm pretty sure one specific element of Metallica knew all the structures. Okay, it was just a new. And uh, now, um, the first bass player. What's what the name? Of? The name of the first bass player in Metallica. <laughs> Thomas, help me here. Um, ah, I'm having a brain fart right Sorry, now. Sorry, I could get my camera back on in time. Cliff Burton, I think you're referring to. Cliff Burton. Who is Cliff technically Burton. the second bass player? Ron McGovern. Oh, right, right. You got me. <laughs> you well, got Cliff me here, Burton, right. Yeah, the one that everyone knows as the original Metallica. Yeah. Cliff Burton totally knew all, the, all those... All those uh, musician um, in the band, for sure. Exactly. Um, Cliff Burton made everybody else in the band listen to a lot of different music. There was James Hatfield saying that during the tour, they were listening to ABBA. <laughs> Imagine Metallica listening to ABBA. Okay, anyway. Um, so, uh, I think that there was a, the input of Cliff Burton there, and they took a pop uh, structure and they changed it purposefully making that part longer. And if you listen to me several of Metallica's songs, they have this structure, but they make uh, some part longer or shorter, or they change slightly the order to make them more interesting. So Metallica is playing the same game that Beethoven was playing, surprisingly enough, <laughs> okay? And the more you know about music theory, the more you are surprised and you are delighted by all these, and the more you appreciate Metallica, in a sense, okay? Um, the, we, we, again, it's interesting. Me, me, those bands made something with that. Those bands are famous for a reason, not, not I mean, for several reasons, but this is one of the reasons why their fans listen to them. I know a lot of people who don't know any music theory, but they have a kind of a, a, an intuitive appro um, appreciation of that. And many of them were telling me exactly, I love Master of Puppets because they take this middle part and they make it super long. Yeah, you see, you are actually understanding these intuitively, but it's the same thing you'll get understanding music theory. And in music theory, you also get, you get more uh, appreciation for that because you know exactly what they are breaking, why they are breaking it, what is the emotional effect of all that, etc., etc. The thing is, the more you understand, the more you appreciate. Okay, it's it's. Some people tell you that the more you understand, the less you appreciate because there's less mystery. No, no. The more you understand, the more 
you see what they're doing, the more you appreciate their the, the, the originality, the more you understand uh, how all this works. It, it's great. It's literally the more you know, the better it is. Okay, so, or at least, that's my opinion, <laughs> as usual. But it's an example of how music theory can help making things surprising or how knowing music theory helps helps you being surprised when somebody does something actually original. Of course, the other side of the coin is that when you listen to formula music and it's just formula music, you're going to get hopelessly bored because you know exactly what's happening. So it's up to you to decide what, what you want to do. But there is some music that I definitely don't listen to anymore because after I listen to the first three chords, I know exactly where it's going. <laughs> There's nothing surprising anymore. So it's true. But other music, stuff. I appreciate Thank you for that, Dr. Zito. So, Tommaso, you have a resource, I believe, that people can check out uh, for free. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That is perfectly correct. All right, but we can get that on the screen here. And this is, let me see if I can. Yay. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a free ebook that I give away if you guys go at the link just below. And this ebook gives you some, inter some, some, some ways to find the right chord for a melody. So if you have a melody uh, that you've wrote, that either you can sing or you can play on your instrument, these ebooks help you find what chords go under this melody. And there is not one, just one right way. There are several, several right ways of doing it. And these ebooks help you <clears throat> exploring <clears throat> this kind of landscape and see what works. It's kind of some of the things we were describing before about having the melodies and the chords below. And I mean, typically when we compose a song, the, the melody is one of the first things we compose. Again, it's not, not always, but lots of people sing a melody or write a melody on their guitar. And then they're like, how do I put this into a song? First step, put the chords under there. And these help you under creating a song with that. And again, these ebooks help you doing just that. It's free, it's short, it's easy. If you guys read these, you, you, you're going through the, this ebook in less than a day, okay? It's, it's very short and it gives you several different strategies and there are playable, played examples so you can go and play them on your guitar. I recommend it if you guys want to learn to understand how all this kind of theory can help you writing actual music. Very good. Uh, and as you mentioned, it's free, so it's a complete, you know, it's a no-brainer. So I also have something for you guys, you guys can check out here. And it's called Guitar Mastery Decoded. And what this will do is it will help you, um, it will help you sort of demystify the fretboard. And this relates partly to music theory, but just also just knowing where things out, where things lay out on your guitar will help you. And, and it, not only does it help you in learning or understanding or applying things like music theory, but it also is very useful in that it helps you be more creative. Now, the ebook is not specifically about creativity, but what it is intended to do is to remove the burden that our brains have when having to, as we're playing or creating, writing songs or improvising, is to remove the stuff we have to think about. Okay, where is this next note? Where is the next chord? What's the next position? Where's the next inversion? What's the next scale pattern? Where's the next arpeggio? You, you try to remove this so that your mind can focus more on simply being creative and it'll help you to master the guitar more easily. And again, like with, like with uh, Dr. Zidio's resource, this is totally free. Uh, you can download it right now and uh, enjoy it. I think it's really, really cool. And I think that you will uh, enjoy this. Okay, so, okay, so. Dr. Zidio, I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for, uh, we're getting an echo at the moment right now. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for all of the uh, knowledge that you have shared with everyone here today. And it's a very interesting uh, discussion. And I just wanted to, Thank you, and I thank also all of the people who asked questions. Uh, a lot of good questions there in the chat, a lot of smart questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zidio. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure being here, and I hope we can do it again in future. We will, for sure. All right, have a good rest of your day, everyone. Take care.
and we'll see you next time.